Cassette Communications Corporation is pleased to give you the following presentation from the Iguanacon, the 36th annual World Science Fiction Convention held in Phoenix, Arizona from August 31st through September 4th, 1978. Uh, a, a, a little business. Uh, this afternoon, we had a panel. <laughs> Those of you who missed it, missed possibly the most significant uh, item on this entire program. It was, a, it was a panel that was chaired by George R. R. Martin and included such writers as Susie McKee Charnas, Edward Bryant, Jack Chalker, and myself, and, 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 and George R. R. Martin. And it was called, if I had it to do all over again, I mean, would you be a writer, would you be a neurosurgeon, or, you know, whatever, or Adolf Hitler, whatever. And um, uh, it, 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 it happened, I, the police departments assure me that there is a temperature that when it is reached, I don't know, 98.6, 100.2, whatever it is, that people go completely bug fuck. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, literally, your brain boils and, 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 and all sorts of terrible things happen. If there's anybody who happens to know what that particular temperature is, you might keep it to your... Yes, sir? 92. Uh, <laughs> who are we to argue? We could be making it up, right? Uh, and and, and uh, when, when that happens, uh, wives brain their husbands with flat irons and, and kids throw each other out of seven-story windows because they stole a toy. And I mean, it really, everybody goes crazy. It's, it's what they call uh, the crazy days or the dog days, whatever it is. In, in, in New York, it happens constantly. And the police keep very close watch on the weather reports because when that happens, it is deep shit time. Um, uh, that has been happening, of course, in these hotels endlessly. Uh, uh, I have gone uh, uh, mad myself at least twice today uh, uh, to the woman on whose purse I jumped up and down in in a frenzy of crazed madness, uh, I, I apologize deeply to the, to the runny egg sucker uh, who called me a hypocrite and whom I goddamn well would have thrown through a window if someone had not said, don't, don't do that. Uh, uh, I do not. I do not apologize. Uh, he... I'm exhausted already for Christ's sake. I'm wearing a suit to show my respect for you. That's true. It is, it is hot. <laughs> they're, they're yelling. They're yelling. Schmucks all over the audience. <laughs> We're going to give you your moment. Sir, the schmuck would just yell over here. Would you stand up, sir? <laughs> I mean, this man is an incipient Charles Manson. I mean, he must have attention. And failing to get it, he will go out and butcher Calvin Coolidge's wife or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's hard enough working to, uh, you know, <laughs> to the uh, entire... Uh, University of South Dakota marching band here, so... Um, let's see, what are we going to do tonight? What are we going to do? We're going to... We're going to read you t uh, at least two new stories that I brought. Uh, one of which... Not now! Turn the lights up! Turn the lights up! <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I'm going to, uh, this is a very important evening for uh, almost everybody here who, who, who gives a damn about seeing science fiction films. Um, I have right here a, a small item on which I have spent nine months of my life. This is the script of iRobot. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, I'll, pa I'll pass that along to Isaac, I know he'll be pleased. Anyhow, uh, this, will, this particular script will be auctioned off sometime at this convention, probably at the roast. This is a very special one, and I'll tell you about what makes it special in a moment. It's the only one that will be available. There are 30 copies of this in the world. This one I brought to read a little bit to you from. But I must tell you why this evening is important, and, and why I'm going to read some of this to you, and why I'm going to ask you some questions, and why I have planted ringers in the audience. Uh, uh, Linda, are you here? Where, where are you, Linda? You're back there, okay. Um, do we have microphones in the audience? God damn it. 
Ron, will you kindly get in touch with communications and tell them to get us floor mics down here in the aisles, one on either side, in stand fucking taneously. <laughs> oh, God, you make an old man out of me. It's disgusting. Um, when I want to work a double Ron, I'll go for George Burns. I'll pass that along to Dad when I see him. Uh, anyhow, I'm going to blow off my pedal. You really think I think I'm the son of God? Of course I don't think I'm the son of God. I am God, asshole! You don't think I'm going to go around and tell people I'm God? Do some schmuckle trying to kill me. Then I'd have to hit him with a bolt of lightning and waste all the electricity and <laughs> Ralph made it be on my ass. I mean, you understand the ramifications of me saying I'm God. Okay. And rah, 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 rah. Don't you don't you love it? It's like people at rock concerts say, Oh, Randy Newman, I love you, Randy, Randy. Now there's always some klutzola and some you know, some 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 prepubescent who has a voice that could crack glass. <laughs> yeah, we went to we went to see Randy at the Universal Amphitheater the other night and uh, he uh, he did short people. <laughs> That's okay. Ran Randy, Ran Randy knew he was a friend of mine, and uh, I was in France, and when I got back, there was a call on the service from him, and I called him, I said, hey, what's happening? He says, listen, I'm sorry. I hope you're not offended. <laughs> so why? What'd you do this time? <laughs> and he says, well, there's this song, see, and it's number one on the charts, and, our, 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 and I said, well, I haven't had a radio on. I don't know what it is. He said, well, I'll send you an album. So he sent me the, sent me the small, uh, little criminals, what a small criminal, whatever the hell it is, tiny criminals album. And, uh, and I put it on, I said, there's short people, thing, and I listened to it, and I, I laughed the first time, and... And then I played it again, and I chuckled, and, uh, <laughs> and I played it a third time, gritted my teeth a lot. And uh, fourth time, I decided I was going to write a song about tall malforms. You know. <laughs> Let's not get into that. There'll be no insults, and no ethnic groups are going to be assaulted and insulted. We're not going to have any of that tonight. There's going to be a feast of reason. You people have all treated me right, except for that asshole Don Markstein. And then, well, what is the story with Don Markstein? Will you tell us already for crazy? Not yet, not yet. Later. Uh, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let that, uh, that particular toad simmer in his own butter for a while. Um, um, we're, going to, uh, we're going to do the iRobot thing, and we've got the two stories, okay. Um, uh, we were gonna have the, uh, the orgy if you remember to bring the Mazzola. You brought the Mazzola, good. Good, uh, the last time she brought crunchy peanut butter. Not good, not good, painful, not good. And as I mentioned this afternoon, we might, have, uh, we might have a black mass if, in fact, we could find a virgin. Because the one we had, he didn't want to go for it. <laughs> so that takes care of all that. Uh, let me open with any... Uh, I was, I've been wearing a t-shirt that says, What Last Dangerous Visions? Uh, but I, I know that question is going to be asked, so I will, I will answer it quickly. Who knows? Now, now on to the next question. <laughs> I love tormenting the animals. Uh, <laughs> okay, the answer to the question is, what are we going to see? It's, 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 people who ask that question always sound like Mr. Gumby to me, you know? <laughs> the rest of these people, they live in Arizona. They don't get Monty Python here. They're not allowed to have it. Oh, really? They gave you Monty Python? That was, they gave you Monty Python as part of the reparations for you having to live here. So, I, I tell you, I mean, I mean, I'm sure you're all wonderful human beings, and I mean, fantastic beyond belief, you're kind to your mothers, and you love animals, and I mean, you're really terrific human beings, but I swear that no human being can live in this iguana and saguarocactus. That's it. Human beings were not meant to live down here. And... <laughs> and, no, wait, now listen, now wait, everybody who's applauding, right, is from a normal part of the universe where... <laughs> And all the ones, all the ones who are sitting down here looking pained and pissed off, you know, you know, they're from here, dig it. Now they hate it too, but they won't cop to it. They ain't gonna cop to it. You know, they've got that stupid provincial pride. You know, they're all in a false caress. Hey man, I'm from Phoenix, you know. You know, and they love when the heat gets up to 180, 180, you know. 
You can fry matzo latkes on the, on the pavement, you know? They love it. They love it. And it's akin to New Yorkers bragging about how many times they've been mugged. Oh, yeah, I stripped off six times last week, man. <laughs> Come on, face up there. You hate it here, for Christ. You're here because your mom and dad are here. No, you would live here if not, right? They cut off the water tomorrow. You'd still live here, right? The air condition, the pool, the pool dries up, cracks down there, the dog dies, the tongue hangs out, everything goes, the air conditioning, that's it, Jack, this is a desert again. The Pimas move back in and chuckle over your corpses, for Christ's sake. We're talking here reality, not provincial pride. You like it. What, you're, why are you crying? <laughs> it's a man of she has tears left in her ducts. Uh, the last page, you're going to say, hello, how are you? <laughs> Jesus, I feel like Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> you know, the convention committee, the convention committee, Bill Patterson, you know, Bill Patterson was at the house. He comes out to California all the time on your money. And he uh, <laughs> lives high. Kid lives high. And uh, he was in the house when I was singing. I was singing in the shower. I was singing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the world-famous, indefatigable schmuckola, Ron Bounds. <laughs> Your mics are coming. Whose aren't? <laughs> Porn. That's what it is, folks. Porn. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> so, uh... Uh... Well, yeah, Bill Patterson comes out. He hears me singing in the shower. And I used to sing for a living, so Bill, you know, Bill, Bill talks a good game. And Bill says, we're going to build for you a plastic bubble with flashing lights. And you're going to sit there, and there's going to be a microphone so you can speak to the people around you. But they won't be able to disturb you and cut them off. And you see what I got? <laughs> I got a plastic wiki up, for Christ's sake. <laughs> they keep telling me the longer I sit under there, you know, the sharper my head will get or something. I don't know. <laughs> Actually, I'm getting mummified in there. So, so he says, he says we're going to, he, he's got big plans. Big El Molto Mondo Bigo. He said, we're gonna have we're gonna have big plants, we're gonna put a combo behind you, we're gonna let you sing again. I said, that's terrific. I said, that's great. I haven't I haven't done a professional gig in years. It'll be my joy and delight to delight them with all my entire repertoire. I'll do, you know, what, just a gigolo and all those big fancy favorites, you know, all the ones that you love from George Burns. And uh, you see a combo? Do you even see, you know, a junkie with an acoustical guitar or anything? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Get Spider. Spider Rob. Spider and I can't keep together. Are you insane? Is Spider in our room? Spiders aren't getting bagged. He's a professional. He doesn't want to hear my shit. Yeah, so, I don't know that one, but if you'll hum a few bars. Now, you see, the interesting thing is, almost all of you have never heard the incredible pellucid tones that can ring from this face. Right? She's heard it. She's heard it. The woman is applauding wildly. Of course, the fact she wants my body has nothing to do with it. Uh, and if I, if I were, in fact, to begin seeing you, would say, Jesus Christ, a little asshole really can sing, can he? But I sang in Los Angeles, right? Yes, I did. Yes, I did, indeed. Um, yeah, but I'm not going to do that tonight. I mean, in honor of Toadie Fields, I'm not going to say... <laughs> what do you mean, screw Toadie Fields? Man, she's dead! What a ghoulish remark. Jesus Christ! You do it with ducks and sheep, too? You're the vomitous, kid. <laughs> mm. You should have heard Susie McKee Charnas on the panel today. She was talking about people who identify her with her books and think that everything in her books has got to be one for one straight out of her life, you know, and they come up and ask her about whether she believes in bestiality, right? <laughs> so, so, she said, only with consulting, consenting beasts. <laughs> if, they, if they squirm and squeak, you don't do it to them. Uh, anyhow, uh, the last Dangerous Visions, which is where we started long before I threatened to sing at you, uh, will be out early in the year. Uh... Yes, that was my friend Robert Silverberg. He blows my cover every goddamn time. Do you know that not once in 500 times does anyone have the sense to ask that? Well, we had planned it for... Uh, we had planned it for... Oh, Christ, this crowd is insane. And people are going to drive me at the wall. There's no telling what I may do tonight. Oh. Woo. 
Anyhow. Uh, <laughs> terrific. Will <laughs> Chamberlain will lose no sleep over me. Um, don't anybody have the courtesy to get up off your fat ass and put my coat on the chair. <laughs> Take it all off. You don't want to see anything that ugly. You just want to laugh at a man without a penis, that's all. Remind me to tell you later how I lost my penis. <laughs> Anyhow, um, The Last Dangerous Visions is 740,000 words, the equivalent of 10 novels. It is about three times the length of Gone with the Wind. It'll be published in three probably boxed, maybe not, but probably boxed identical sets. Uh, it has 120 stories by 112 authors, none of whom were in Dangerous Visions or again Dangerous Visions, including among others, many others, a full novel by Richard Wilson, uh, Michael Moorcock, uh, New Cordwainer Smith story, uh, Frank Herbert, uh, I, they, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, uh, each one has a full page illustration, but why don't you put it in the middle of the, uh, oh, okay, here, this is cool. Can you all see what this? <laughs> There's no cord there, sir. <laughs> uh, all right, don't get mean. Do not mean to get you cranky. Uh, uh, each one has a full page illustration by uh, Tim Kirk with the exception of the Cordwainer Smith story which has a fold out. Uh, each book has a, uh, has a four color wrap around uh, cover illustration by uh, Tim Kirk. Um, uh, it'll sell probably for I guess about 30, 35 bucks. Uh, and don't wait for it in the science fiction book club, friends. No. 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 They, they, uh, they messed me over once too often and I pulled strange wine and as far as I'm concerned they can hold that till I come back. So uh, uh, you're going to have to pay full price or wait, uh, you know, six, eight years till it gets in paperback. At which point by then paperbacks will cost you five dollars a piece and they'll put it in eight paperbacks. So five times, uh, you know, six is thirty dollars anyhow. So why not have a nice hard cover and, you know, fuck it. Okay, that answers that question. Now we will take random and hope, we hope, vicious questions from the audience uh, for a few minutes and then I'll get into some other things. Uh, I will answer at this time uh, any question you ask with absolute and utter candor. I will hold nothing back. Make sure your question is not stupid or I will abuse you hideously and you will look like a fool beside your friends. Are you sure you want that hand up? I thought you'd reconsider. Michael Toman, Michael, oh shut up. Michael Toman, yeah, have you noticed Nancy that I have a way of kind of turning an audience into a mob? <laughs> You should see when I really get crazy, when I do my religion number, they go berserk. You want to see my religion number, too? You want me to do my Reverend Ike? You ready? You want me to see? No, I can't do that. I, to, this, to this crowd? To this a perfect crowd? Should I do the sea of green? Hey, hey, hey! Uh, Jesus Christ, I'm supposed to be a writer, man. You know, I 25 years producing work of incredible you know, golden wonder and, 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 and intelligence and, and you're turning me into a cheap entertainer here. This is not right. <laughs> We're just all having a good time here, aren't we? Uh, all right, maybe I'll do the religion number later. I'll tell them the story and then I'll do the religion number. I don't cross my heart. I'm a Jew, schmuck. <laughs> Silverberg is holding his face and saying to himself, Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. What is it? L let me ask you, Bob. What is it? Is it that you had such high hopes for me that I was going to be a mensch and I'm still a schmuck? May 27, 1934. No, 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 don't, please. I'm running. Don't, don't. Michael Toman, what is your question, sir? Would you stand and speak so that the, the entire gathering can hear you? The world famous Michael Toman, member of SFWA, fine young writer. <laughs> Shave off the mustache, ugly, ugly. <laughs> yes. What are the 39 steps? <laughs> <laughs> the 39 steps are a super secret organization of spies who pass information. <laughs> Didn't think I knew, did you, huh? And, 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 uh, and I can't tell you who the actor was. Which, which version do you want to know who the actor was who played uh, Mr. Mental? 30, oh, the 1931? 
Uh, that was the little guy with the mustache whose name was... Um, no, 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 Robert Donut was the, was the, was the hero. Uh, uh, Bernard... Bernard... No, very clever. Very clever. I'm glad you're displaying your erudition, such as it is. Uh, Bernard, Bernard Witsit. Wh uh, not Witsit. It's like Witsit. Bernard, something like Witsit. W-H-I-T. It sounds like, sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> bigger than a bread box. He's bigger than a bread box. And aren't we all? Gentleman back there with the ugly blue shirt on. <laughs> yes, sir. How much is this to take over this <laughs> Listen, I got I got to tell you a funny story. I tell you a funny story. In, in response to that, I, uh, uh, I've done a lot of talk shows. I don't write TV anymore, nor do, nor do I ever intend to write it again. I think it is really purely evil. As you, if you've ever bought Strange Wine, you can see the introduction of the book, and and the final conclusion of that is that I am out of TV forever, folks. I think it is just too awful and ugly for people. And I urge you all to throw away your sets or turn them off or only watch cable movies or something like that. And, uh, you know, an occasional Python show, and, and maybe that's cool, or something on PBS once in a while, but that's it. That's it. Other than that, piss off. None of it. No Starsky and Hutch, no Charlie's Angels. All you guys got to beat off to something else now. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, we've just been told that these mics uh, are, are now on. They will be when we want to use them. And please be very careful to avoid the cords and not to... Well, actually, we can, <clears throat> we can help do that if we take the cord out of the walk path. I, I think that's possibly a terrific idea. And by turning it this way, that's called uh, science. <laughs> or balling the jack, whichever comes first. I don't know. Um, uh, the, so the, the, I've never done the Tonight Show, and, and uh, uh, for a while I worried about that because I wanted to sell my books, and you know, that's the best place to sell books to schmucks. Uh, doesn't matter what it is, you know, have a meaningful relationship with your brown rice, you know, <laughs> rolfing for fun and profit, anything like that. They always have one of those clowns on at least once, you know, in between, in between the John Denver numbers and uh, 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 who's, the, who's the other guy, John, uh, John Davidson uh, camping and, you know, playing a pseudo fag. I mean, it's really nice. <laughs> Uh, it's a tasty show, it's a tasty show, if you happen to have no brow at all. And um, so they, they, they never called me, and I got, you know, I got really, really got uptight about that, and I, and I thought, you know, I really got to sell some books. And I thought about it, but it never happened. Then one day, one day, they called, and I was suddenly confronted with that burning moment in which stardom could be mine. I mean, you know, if, if Bobby Blake could make it, and, and Bobby and I are old friends, and I often lapse into that, that very voice because, we, I mean, he's imitating me. I don't imitate him. I want you to understand that. Uh, I knew that if Bobby Blake could make it on that show, I would be back again and again and again. I mean, you couldn't turn on your goddamn set without seeing my fat mouth running at you. <laughs> huh? And I said, is it that bad, Nancy? Boy, has she got a furrowed brow. This is a woman who's really, she really dislikes me. Really? It's like, don't worry, I don't even want to sell to Avon, for Christ's sake. I had it with Avon. I, Peter, little Petey Mayer. Little Petey Mayer was one. I, is, is, uh, they've changed their shade of lipstick, have they? they? You still have, what was that guy's name? Bob, uh, Wyatt. Is Bob Wyatt still there? What do you mean, shut up? Why is not? He's a, he'll knock on anybody. He has no friends, no allies. Silverberg is sitting beside, is, is Bob Wyatt still there? I ought to tell the Bob Wyatt story. Would you like to hear the Bob Wyatt story? I'll tell you the Bob Wyatt story since I finished telling you the Tonight Story. <laughs> I didn't want you to think. Bob Wyatt story is a terrific story. It's one, of, it's one of the great stories of violence, action, and danger in the American publishing industry. Uh, <laughs> cast of thousands, no two alive. <laughs> one can only hope. Uh, uh, anyhow, so they call up suddenly from the Tonight Show. And um, uh, they, they called up because I had been... Uh, at a, at, a, at a kind of an evening thing, a, 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 not a roast, a dinner, at which I had spoken, and the guy who was the booker for The Tonight Show was also there. And uh, he thought I was cute and clever and, and really fast and, and thought I could do very, very well. And, you know, add a, add a little literary tone. I mean, they would have slipped me into the egghead section. You know, that five minutes at the end where John Lilly explains why it is dolphins talk in Urdu, and um, <laughs> Carl Sagan explains the ethical structure of the universe in 44 seconds, you know. <laughs> They put Isaac Asimov next to Raquel Welch and he fumphas for two hours, you know. 
you know, you've all, you've all seen that. It's, 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 it's called broadening the audience, speaking up to them, right? It's wonderful. So, anyhow, uh, so, they, so there's a schmucko call, and uh, he says, uh, I, uh, I saw you uh, the other night. You, you may remember me. Uh, my name is Howard, not Cassell, Howard, uh, I had to say it fast. I, mean, I, I knew it wasn't Cassell, but I knew there would be some jerko out there. Like, oh, wow. It was Howard, uh, ah, doesn't matter. Anyhow, Howard somebody. And, uh, and he says, uh, he says I, think, I, think we could, I, I think we could really, uh, we could really move you on the Tonight Show. <laughs> you, you want me to pass gallstones? Is that? <laughs> no, no, we'd we really like to have you come on. Really, I want to have you come on. And uh, can you prepare a fast five, six minutes for us to look at? I said, what do you mean, prepare a fast five, six minutes for you to look at? So well, we'd like to see some material. We'd like to see whatever it is that you would like to talk about. I mean, you know, whatever it is you want to talk about. I said, I never know what I'm going to talk about until I get up on the platform and I start talking. I said, and, and, and how much time would you, would, you, would you give me? He said, what do you mean, how much time would we give you? I said, well, how much time am I going to be getting? I mean, where's my placement on the show? Now, he suddenly realizes that he's not dealing with a, with a banana, you know, that I've done shows, and I know that you don't go on, like, after the horse act, you know, forget it. And uh, so he says, well, uh, you'd, uh, you'd probably be in what we call our literary nook. And, <laughs> and I said, I met her, I met her. And... Uh, she was not all that uh, terrific. Anyhow, uh, I said, uh, no, I would, I would want to go on. I would want to be, I guess, second guest, and I'd need at least 20, at least 20 minutes. And, uh, you know, and we'd like, I'd like to do it with the long section where the, where the commercial break for the Alpo comes before. And, and, like, so, and he says, well, I, I don't know. I, he says, you know, we, we'd really have to work on that. We'd have to work on that. And I said, no, nah, I think about it. I don't really want to be on your show. I mean, I mean, you cannot believe a silence akin to that found at the Maricot Deep. <laughs> you know, I mean, just a concept beyond the man's ken. A human being in our day and age who does not, in fact, wish to rap with Johnny. <laughs> and he says, uh, he says, no, I don't think you understand. I'm offering you a spot on the Tonight Show. I said, I understand exactly what you're offering me. I said, I don't, I don't want it. He said, what do you mean you don't want it? I said, I said the schmucks who would watch your program would be too dumb to read my books to begin with. That's the truth. Now, footnote, little asterisk, and down the bottom we got the asterisk, right? Half this audience did not applaud that. <laughs> Those of you who did can turn around and go, ha ha, at them. Right? 11 o'clock at night, instead of doing something important like getting laid, reading Shakespeare, You're watching Shasha Kapoor describe her diamonds and Don Rickles insult the other guy's tie. Wonderfully enriching. You're one... No, no, he's trying to cover. He's trying to cover. This is, this is, this is the kind of guy who says, I only shoveled in the bodies. I didn't kill anyone. <laughs> Waiting for the tomorrow show. You're asleep by that time and you know it. Anyhow, so uh, I said no and, and, and I did not do the, 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 the Tonight Show. And as a consequence, they, they did not offer me the, the, the new host ship when Johnny goes to that great game show in the sky. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we were now going to tell you the Bob Wyatt story. This is a fascinating story. And Mr. Silverberg play, is, it has a part in this too, and, uh, as does Michael Moorcock and Norman Spinrad. At one, one time, uh, I, I had sold a book called uh, the, uh, the Beast Shop... No, it wasn't Beast. It was, it was Partners in Wonder. That's what it was. A book of mine called Partners in Wonder. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to, to Avon. Uh, a house which had done a spectacularly abysmal job on marketing the beast that shot at love at the heart of the world. Uh, lost it. Lost it. Uh, I think that was the year that, uh, uh, that uh, 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 little P.D. Mayer had his big success, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, and uh, he was floating on that for years thereafter. And he was buying a lot of stuff that didn't make any money at all, but everybody thought he was the young boy wonder. See, so they had this book. They also had in the house at that time, it was Partners in Wonder, it was Robert Silverberg's, was it Night Wings? I think it was Night Wings. It was Night Wings. Michael... Mo <laughs> I love the way he leads his own clack. It's marvelous. Uh, it was Michael Moorcock's Behold the Man. And Norman Spinrad's Bug Jack Barron. Now that is about as heavyweight a group of books as I can think of right offhand, all to come out in the space of a month or two. And they did. They all came out exactly at the same time. What happened was, at that time, Avon, being an upwardly mobile, uh, uh, you know, hirer of anyone, uh, epileptics, spastics, uh, basket cases, brain damage cases, the m people from the outpatient clinic of the Menager Foundation, you know, they'll, they'll hire anyone, uh, had hired a group of young people, 
persons, male or female, I do not know, they would never tell me, uh, who all, all of whom had graduated from, I believe, the Seven Sisters schools. I mean, they were all, these were all terrifically literate and wonderful people who had been brought up on John Updike, and uh, you read a little cheever from time to time, and once in a while when you're feeling a little daring, you take a little shot on the buck off. You know, that's it. That's as far as you go. And here these people were, fresh out of, you know, Choate and Andover and wretched places like that, and, 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 and they were given these science fiction manuscripts to edit. <laughs> edit. At Avon, the word edit was synonymous with taxidermy. <laughs> they proceeded to rewrite. I'm not talking editing, I'm talking rewrite whole paragraphs, pages, sections, chapters of these books of these books that you bought. Somehow Norman found out about it and uh, got back his galleys and was able to... Uh, Norman, you know. Is Norman here? Norman. No, that's him. Norman, uh, Norman, uh, Norman uh, has a temper. Uh, you may have seen him at one of the panels this morning at which he demonstrated his temper. Norman does that. And he called up and raised holy hell, and they sent him his galleys, and he went back to his carbon, and he had them reset the whole damn thing. You did the same thing on Night Wings, did you not? Yes. What did you do? Did you have them rewrite it? Had, Bob had them reset the entire book at enormous cost. Uh, Michael Moorcock didn't know about it, and he was in England, and behold, the man went through in a completely bottlerized and butchered version. The Avon edition is absolutely and utterly worthless. It can, it, I mean, it's virtually unreadable. My book... I found out about in time, and I called for my editor, George Ernstberger, who was a very nice, very gentle, very kind man who didn't like arguments with anybody. And George had gone off to the National Book Awards, and he had left for me to be mailed out by his secretary, my galleys, on his desk. They never got out. I knew they never got out. I called Avon to get my galleys. This is on a Friday afternoon. It was late Friday in New York. It's three hours earlier in L.A. And I get a young woman who answers the phone and I tell her who I am and I say, look, George meant for me to have these. They're on his desk in such and such a manila envelope because George had described it to me and he's off to the MBA uh, and I, I need them. It is urgent that I get these immediately. She says, well, I, I don't have the authority to do that. I said, look, 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 there's no authority involved in this. I mean, we're not asking you to, you know, sanction the Brinks robbery. Uh, what this is, is my galleys are in a envelope, ma'am, on George's desk. I'm telling you from 3,000 miles away where it is with my name and address on it. All I'm asking you to do is schlep it to the mail room and have them send it out on the overnight. Well, I don't have the authority uh, to do that. How many of those have you ever gotten in your life, friend? <laughs> I mean, that ain't just general stupidity. Them's good Germans is what them is. And I said, I said, look, lady, I am a crazed axe murderer and rapist. <laughs> in that order. And if and you don't haul your ass into George's office and slip that down to the mailroom, I am personally going to come there and disembowel you. Do I make myself abundantly clear? And she says, well, I, I, I mean, you can't even reach these people with threats. I mean, they are so inured. God knows what they're like in bed. And you say, uh, so she says, well, I'll let you talk to one of our editors here. Uh, Mr. Bob Wyatt I said, fine, I'll talk to Bob Wyatt, senior editor at Avon Books. Man must be a man of good common sense and integrity, perception, wonderful human being in all ways. I hang on this long distance line at my expense for an inordinately long length, an inordinate length of time. Finally comes on a voice, closet gay like that. Got you spotted me there. So imperious, 
so arrogant for Christ's sake. I mean, it just oozed across the line. Hello. Ah, uh, yes, sir. To whom am I speaking? Now, this is Robert A. C. W. R. E. Wyatt. Tertius. And I am an Well, look, Mr. Wyatt, my name is Harlan Ellison. Oh, well, who are you? I'm one of your authors. You are? Yes, I don't want that to come as a shock to your nervous system. Yes, I am. In fact, you have, this is my second book. Uh, we have a very small uh, mechanical problem which I would like you to facilitate if you would, sir. And what is that? That is that my galleys for my book are sitting on George Ernstberger's desk and they are screwed and I want to get them immediately and George left them for me and rushed off to the NBA in Washington, D.C. and I would appreciate it if you would advise that young woman to kindly slip it into the mail room because it's already addressed and I would like to get it. I, I don't know about doing anything like this. It's Friday afternoon, you know. <laughs> Figured that out all by yourself, didn't you? <laughs> I'm not exaggerating as much. A little. I mean, a little, a little for laughs and, and, and to keep from really getting, getting mean about it because I don't know if you've ever been frustrated by one of those kind of people who knows their shit don't stink and you're just not worth noticing, man. But I really was getting up tight. And I said, look, Mr. Wyatt, I don't want any hassles. I said, I don't want to have to, you know, call my attorney or my agent and enjoin you against publication of the book, which I will happily do. But I want to see those galleys. I don't have to be bothered with this, and I don't have to talk to the likes of you. I'm an editor here, and it is Friday afternoon, and I have to be off something like the squash. He didn't say squash court, but it was something like the handball court or the, the, the health club, some goddamn thing. And I went out of my fucking brain. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I repeated a curse word twice, and I didn't stop for four minutes, you know. <laughs> the politest thing I called him was a cancer. <laughs> And I really went. I went crazy. And he, and, and, he, and he hung up on me, right? Bang, down goes the phone. Now I'm... I mean, I'm Lou Ferrigno going for Hulk, Jim. I wanted to tear that sucker's entrails out. And I called Bob Mills, my agent. Bob Mills is, an, is a gentleman of advanced years who is a gentleman of the old school of agenting. He, I have never heard Bob Mills raise his voice. In all the years that he's been my agent, and that's, I mean, that's like 20 years maybe, 16 to 20 years, never, even when I've done the stupidest thing that has cost him thousands of dollars in commissions, he has never, I've never heard the man raise his voice. I called him, and I'm going, Bob, you goddamn son of a bitch, I'm my own, I didn't find that God, I'm going to love you, I'm going to cry, I'm going to find that Bob Solo, God. He says, uh, calm down. <laughs> Take a deep breath. <laughs> and I say, God damn, Bob Mills! <laughs> and I did it all over again. Finally, he gets me, he gets me rational. And I explain to him what has gone down. And he says, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And he, he does. He takes care of those things. So I sit by the phone, biting off pieces of the Bakelite, you know, for about 15 minutes. And the phone rings. And I grab it instantly, knowing that it's Bob, because it's now it's now uh, uh, about uh, 2.30 in L.A., so it has, uh, has to be about 5.30 in New York. So I know that, you know, he's, if he's talked to him, he's, he's obviously talked to me to call me back immediately. He's obviously talked to Sandy. He's now calling me back. And I pick up the phone, you know, and I hear, God damn it, son of a bitch! Bob Wyatt, in the Olympian arrogance of his stupidity, had refused to send out those galleys. And the book went to press. And it wasn't Partners in Wonder, it was, uh, it was The Beast That Shouted Love at the Heart of the World. That's exactly what it was. The book went to press, and the paperback edition is a completely rewritten edition of that book. 
The only true one is the one that is now out from NAL or the one that came from the Science Fiction Book Club. My book was totally and completely rewritten. That's my history with Avon. I tell you this truly, Nancy. If Bob Wyatt should walk into this room at this moment, and we're talking now eight years later, <laughs> I would fling myself at his throat like a crazed yeti. I don't think, I don't, I mean, I, I get angry a lot. It's a state of nature for me. I do not think I have ever been angrier or more frustrated and helpless. And um, I gave George shit when he came back, didn't do any good. He left any house very soon. So now Avon has swept the house again, and little Petey Mayer has been thrown out on his tuchus. And uh, a long time ago, he went over to Pocket Books. A long time ago, he went over to Pocket Books, where he has recently been thrown out on his tuchus, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Peter, Peter, Peter Mayer is one of the people responsible for the infamous pocketbook contract about which you have heard so much. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was taken from the original model that was used by Simon Legree to keep Uncle Tom <laughs> in his cabin. <laughs> it was not a good contract. Uh,